Hörs det? Oh. Det funkar det här, eller? Well, welcome to Flemingsbury and uh, Southern University. Uh, my name is Apostolis Papakostas. I'm professor of sociology here and the editor of uh, this wonderful series. Uh, I wish to welcome on behalf of the faculty and uh, our rector, I wish to welcome you here. For you. Uh, we are honored that you accepted to uh, give this lecture. Uh, and uh, we shall start here uh, with Maria Zakariason. She will uh, speak for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, and then Jenny Berlund will make an, an introduction uh, of your work and you. And then uh, you will speak for about 45 something. minutes or something like that. Something like that yeah. And then we have some kind of space for questions. Uh, and please, when you ask questions, state your name. Uh, the series, the lectures are printed, so I have some copies here. Feel free to take the mm -hmm. ones you wish, and we shall print your lecture as well Thank you. Uh, soon. Uh, so, Maria, please. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Maria Sekereason. I'm a professor in ethnology, and I'm also the director of research at the Department of Teacher Education. And I'm very happy that I've been able to cooperate with religious studies. Uh, to invite uh, Professor Robert Jackson to Sartorne University and to this Sartorne lecture. Uh, and as most of you know, at the Department of Teacher Education, we have an intercultural profile. Uh, it's also a uh, um, multidisciplinary teacher education. Uh, and we're working actively with strengthening uh, the research and research foundation connected to teacher education. And we also work a lot with internationalization so having Professor Robert Jackson here is a contribution both to our research foundation and to our work with internationalization. Uh, and when we work with uh, intercul the intercultural profile, uh, we try to give the students, the teacher education students, tools to deal with the different intercultural challenges and possibilities that they're going to come across when they work in the schools and preschools later on. Uh, and we put a lot of focus on the democratic work they're supposed to do in the schools and the fundamental values of the schools. So what Professor Jackson is going to talk about is of high interest to us. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So welcome. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Jenny. Okay, uh, hello, my name is uh, Jenny Berglund. Uh, I am associate professor at the Study of Religions department and I'm also visiting associate professor at the University of Warwick, where uh, Robert, Professor Robert Jackson come from. So, more than 10 years ago, when I was a doctoral student, I met Professor Robert Jackson, Bob, uh, for the first time at a conference in Bremen, I think it was then. Uh, he has through the years been immensely generous and supportive in many ways for a very large group of uh, scholars. He has an incredible international scholarly network. If you need a connection in whatever country who is involved in research on religion and school, religious education, he will know somewhere there. You can be completely sure about that. I know it by now. Bob is the founding director of the Warwick Religions and Education Research Unit, which is one of the most central and influential research units on religious education in Europe, if not in the world. He was director of the research unit from 1994 to 2012 and remains an active member. He is and has for a long time been a leading figure in international debates about religions and education in Europe and beyond. He has, for example, contributed to the Council of Europe's work on religious diversity and education since 2002, which we will soon uh, hear more about. He was a member of the drafting team of the Council of Europe Ministerial Policy Recommendation on teaching about religions and beliefs, uh, and also the OCSE Toledo's Guiding Principle on teaching about religions and beliefs. 
He, at present, he is expert uh, advisor to the European Vergeland Center, a Council of Europe related center based in Oslo, specializing in intercultural citizenship and human rights education. And also, he is a guest professor at Stockholm University, which you also see there on the slide. Uh, Professor Jackson has taken a leading role in a range of research projects in Europe and the UK, including a uh, European uh, Union Framework 6 project on religions, education, dialogue and conflict involving six European uh, universities, the so-called REDCO project. He has a publication list th that is as long as uh, Vasaloppet perhaps, <laughs> Where, for example, his book on religious education and the interpretative approach has been highly influential in teacher educations all around the world. Also here at uh, Södertörn uh, University where we used it. Robert Jackson's book, uh, another uh, book by uh, Professor Jackson, Rethinking Religious Education and Plurality, Issues in Diversity and Pedagogy, was selected by the American Academy of Religion for special discussion, a conference, the American Academy of Religion is, has also a conference with 10,000 part participants, uh, so a great honor in that way. In 2013, he was uh, presented with the William Rainey Harper Award by the Religious Education Association in the US and was given lifetime membership. His latest book is Signposts, Policy and practice for teaching about religions and non-religious worldviews in intercultural education. It was published in 2014 by the Council of Europe to support policymakers, schools and teacher trainers across Europe in utilizing their recommendation. Signpost has already been translated into nine European languages and more translations are in preparation. Just the other day uh, I got the translation into Arabic uh, from Professor Jackson. It is therefore with great pleasure that I welcome uh, Professor Robert Jackson, or Bob as I usually say, uh, to, to as uh, this year's uh, Södertörn lecturer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, oh. <laughs> well it, it really is an honour and a privilege to be invited to do the annual Södertörn lecture and uh, I'm delighted to be here to do it. We've just had the, the most wonderful discussion about uh, religious education in relation to teacher training and the study of religions and so on. It was just terrific to be able to sit in uh, on, on that discussion. And I had my first visit here only really uh, a couple of months ago to a terrific uh, conference on the study of religions that attracted academics from all over Sweden. Uh, really every Swedish university was represented at that really excellent conference and it was a privilege to be here. But of course I mainly know Södertörn University through my uh, knowledge uh, of Jenny and through working with uh, Jenny Berglund at my university in Warwick where she's visiting associate professor and also where, uh, at Stockholm University where we have a seminar on uh, religious education or religions and education that includes Södertörn University, so Frederick Janka is also there as well as Jenny and it also includes Stockholm School of Theology as well as Stockholm University, so uh, we're very well uh, connected. Um, I have done a, a written version of this lecture which is rather longer than the spoken version and that will be available uh, in printed form, but I'm going to speak, I prefer to speak naturally as it were, uh, speak to a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I'll give a little bit of background uh, and Jenny asked me to say just a little bit about religious education in Sweden. Um, then I'll discuss a concept of inclusive public religious education say something about modern human rights codes and then say something about dialogue in relation to discussing human rights issues and then introduce the Council of Europe and that will be the main uh, part of the lecture and the book signposts that Jenny mentioned, draw some conclusions and tell you about some things that we're trying to do now and that we plan to do in the fairly near future. 
Um, well, uh, there are 47 member states in the Council of Europe. You can just imagine the diversity of education systems that exist there and the different approaches to religious education. When it's there, as was pointed out in our seminar j just half an hour ago, um, France, for example, does not have a subject called religious education, even though it can be done in schools. But Sweden has really taken a lead, uh, in a sense. There have been influences from secularization and religious plurality, mainly, of course, associated with migration, all over Europe. And sometimes those influences are positive, sometimes negative, but they are there. But Swedish religious education changed early and has been expected to be neutral and plural and objective from an early time, from, from the 1960s. And that's rare in international terms. And of course, the subject knowledge of Christianity became knowledge of religions and other life views. And its didactics were very much grounded in, and are grounded in, life questions, shared existential questions, influenced by child-centred thinking. Just uh, about three weeks ago, some of us were in Sigtuna for a conference celebrating the work of Sven Hartmann, who was highly influential on all of this. The situation in England runs a little bit parallel. I'm not going to go into it, um, but I think it probably has been influenced more by religious pluralization than Sweden has. When I first moved to the city of Coventry and began a career as a teacher educator in the 1970s, it was a time when many South Asians were migrating, not from India and Pakistan, but from East Africa. Uh, after East African countries had become independent following the end of the British Empire. And South Asians weren't welcome in those countries anymore. Of course, the classic case was Uganda, where people had 90 days to leave, and they came to Britain as refugees. Some are still very close friends of mine. Um, uh, so when people say negative things about migrants, I start to get just a little bit cross and think about what I've benefited. I had a complete education from those people. Uh, I had a background in theology and philosophy. I thought I knew a, a bit about religions like Hinduism until I started to meet Hindus and then actually realized how little I knew and I learned a great deal from them. Um, yeah. Okay, a, a generic view then of inclusive public uh, religious education. For me, such a form of religious education does not have one aim. There's not just one reason for doing it. Um, I'm quite old fashioned in some ways and um, I used to read uh, Paul Hurst, a British philosopher of education, and Philip Phoenix, an American philosopher of education, both of whom argued in slightly different ways that in a democracy we should have a liberal education that covers all areas of human knowledge and experience. And if you don't cover them all, it's not a proper education. And that included religions and other beliefs as well. So I think there is that kind of... I, I'd give the same argument for creative arts, which in my own country are to some extent being marginalised, particularly in music, I think, in, especially in primary education. But uh, I mentioned that. So... I accept that liberal education argument very strongly. But of course there are also instrumental arguments uh, for including religions, study of religions and other life views in education. Um, and that's because that study can contribute to students' personal development. Um, it can contribute to their moral development. It might contribute to their spiritual development. Uh, development. And I don't mean that when we teach about religions that children should adopt the religion that we're talking about, I don't mean that at all, but that they should have some knowledge and understanding. And the understanding is really important, not just the facts, understanding of it. And they should engage with it uh, as well. And that engagement includes the possibility of reflecting on what they've learned, as well as having the opportunity 
uh, of uh, being constructively critical. Such a religious education can also contribute to social development. Uh, we discussed this a bit in our seminar just a few minutes ago. Um, and there are those who would say, oh, well, if you're only doing it to try and make society cohesive, uh, that's not a terribly good reason for studying religion. Actually, I think it is. But it's, that's not the only reason. That's the point. There are other very good reasons as well. So learning to live together is very important. Um, it doesn't follow automatically that just learning about religions helps you to live together with others. It depends how it's done. Uh, uh, and it depends on the thinking that goes on and the reflection that goes on in the classroom. Um, I, have a, I have two daughters actually, but one of my daughters uh, is, my, my elder daughter, is the head teacher of a large South London primary school. Very multicultural, she has over 40 different languages in the school. Well, she and I agree that religious education does not have a monopoly on values education, on moral education. Moral education is the province of the whole curriculum, and I really mean the whole curriculum, including a subject like mathematics or science, um, plus the ethos of the school. And in her school, for example, they have a value of the week, which is reflected upon by everybody in the school, staff of all kinds and students. It's not just the job of religious education. And I'll be repeating several times that religious education should not be an isolated subject. Um, inclusive education, religious education and human rights. Well, of course, human rights are especially relevant to the instrumental social argument, the argument about learning to live together. And Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is specifically about freedom of religion or belief that in a democratic society you should have the freedom to adopt whichever religion or non-religious philosophy you want to adopt. However, the human rights codes equally support, also support, the right of parents and others to have a particular religion or philosophy and their right to guide their children in a family environment reflecting their beliefs and values. That's almost a direct quotation uh, from the European Convention on Human Rights, Article uh, 14. Thus, it's, I think it's very important indeed that an open, pluralistic religious education where you learn about religions uh, and you reflect on that learning should maintain a dialogue with faith-based forms of religious education. They should not be seen as incompatible. They should be seen as compatible and hopefully complementary. Uh, I could mention many examples, but I, I want to mention Jenny um, because Jenny is doing research with a colleague of mine in London with Muslim pupils, both in their faith-based mosque school environment, but also in their day schools. And they are very interested in that research in how young people are bringing together those two forms of education and how it is shaping uh, their thinking. So um, that's important. Also important is that in um, a state-funded pluralistic school, um, you're always going to have some minorities. Uh, and often it will be a very small minority from a particular religion or a particular religious denomination. And we do have some research showing that some of those young people feel that teachers and resources, textbooks, have not shown sensitivity to where they come from, which may not be some kind of generalised overview of Hinduism or Christianity or Sikhism or Islam or whatever, but something much more specific. So we need to show sensitivity to the students who are in our schools. Turning now to the modern human rights codes, uh, the first, of course, was the Universal Declaration, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. 
just after the Second World War. And of course, in response to the appalling human suffering and genocide of the Holocaust. And the people who were behind that were people like Eleanor Roosevelt, who argued very strongly for it. Winston Churchill, British conservative politician. I, I wish he were there now, I have to say, uh, rather than the lot who are there. Um, uh, argued that uh, we had to have uh, a code of human rights and that that code had to be internationally enacted and internationally discussed, otherwise it would not work. And that Universal Declaration, I still think is a rather beautiful and moving document, um, the key concept within it is human dignity. And human dignity is not a characteristic of the citizens of a particular state. It is an inherent characteristic of being human. That is the point. That's what human rights are about. They are universal and they apply to everybody, including migrants and refugees, wherever they come from. Uh, the next important convention was after the Council of Europe had been formed, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. It's um, a, a very important convention. I'll say a little bit more later. Then, of course, there are other human rights codes like the hugely important UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Well, it seems almost fashionable at the moment to criticise human rights. And you get criticisms from a number of different angles. I've just taken a kind of sample set of uh, criticisms. Uh, the last one I uh, give, do give some particular attention to, um, but uh, you'll see some responses to some of the others as well. The idea that human rights values are not universal, but are relative to a particular time, post-European enlightenment and a particular Western context. And that there are Western enlightenment assumptions about individualism and autonomy in the human rights codes. There are some who argue that human rights are entirely derived from one religion, from Christianity. And there's a very different postmodernist view uh, that says that human rights represent just simply one set of values competing with other sets of values. The one that interests me out of this lot in particular is the last one. Um, Anybody heard of the Interaction Council? It's not well known. It was actually set up by Helmut Schmidt after he'd finished his role as Chancellor of Germany. And it consists of former heads of state from around the world. And they've done some very interesting things. One thing that they've done is to draft a universal declaration of human responsibilities that match the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, um, slight unfairness is that the Universal Declaration does mention duties in Article 29. It says everyone has duties to the community, but it doesn't say much beyond that. But if you look up the Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities, it takes each human right and matches it with a, a corresponding responsibility. So, for example, if I have the right to education, then I have the responsibility to help others to be educated. I think that's very interesting. And I've used this in discussion with students in school, with teacher training students, and with students in university. And it makes a very interesting discussion document to use alongside the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, well, is there Western bias in the Universal Declaration? I think undoubtedly there is some, um, but there are various things that we have to remember. First of all, um, the drafting committee wasn't entirely Western. There were uh, people, there was someone from the Lebanon, there was someone from the Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, of course, was the Republic of China then. Uh, also, uh, and uh, uh, I've talked a lot um, with a person called Heiner Bielefeld. He's now a professor of human rights in Germany, in um, Nuremberg. 
Uh, but Heine was the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, which is how we met. And we worked together uh, with, with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And latterly, we, we both uh, worked together in uh, Oslo uh, at a conference. Um, but he has done some really, really excellent writing on trying to show that, yes, there is some Christian influence on the human rights codes, but it's not, it's not at all totally derived from there. And I'd, I quoted him at some length in the written version of this paper, but just a short quotation here. St. Paul emphasises spiritual equality between free man and slave, but he never criticises slavery in social reality. You see, uh, the human rights codes are different from that. I use um, uh, the concept dialogical liberalism when I say, as I sometimes do in a Council of Europe uh, context, certain human rights, let's treat them more as general principles rather than very strict rules. So there can be some discussion and dialogue, particularly about autonomy, uh, because, you know, Yes, we are autonomous, but are we always autonomous? Don't we sometimes have responsibilities to others that are so strong that it limits our autonomy? And there's, a, a, again, a, yeah, a really interesting discussion to have uh, there. Um, I couldn't resist uh, putting this up. I took that photograph in June of this year. Uh, I was in uh, Oslo, a place I like to be in. I like, I like to be in Stockholm. Uh, and uh, I was at a conference of a particular uh, research project, but one of the people running the uh, conference was also involved in this particular evening. He was chairing it uh, at a public space, uh, you may have been, the Literature House uh, in Oslo, and there was a panel, and it was fascinating. Um, the panel from left to right, Christian, a humanist. She was the humanist, incidentally, who took the Norwegian government to court over uh, uh, the nature of religious education at the time. Uh, a Muslim and a Jew. Now, we were able to ask all sorts of questions. Many of the questions were about human rights. And what took place was the most marvellous example of dialogue, I think, really. Um, first of all, it was very clear that each of them had very, very strong personal commitments. Christian, humanist, Muslim, Jew. That is what the political philosopher John Rawls called comprehensive liberalism. The notion that within society you are free to have and to hold the beliefs that you choose to hold. However, you've also got to live in society with others. And there has to be a common commitment to democracy. And it was soon clear that all of those four not only had their personal strong commitments, but they shared a common commitment to human rights and to democracy. That is what John Rawls calls political liberalism. Now, as we asked our questions and as they responded, sometimes, not all that often, there was complete agreement amongst the four. Sometimes there were disagreements, real disagreements. Most of all, the views were overlapping. They were coming to some kind of consensus, but they weren't saying exactly the same things. Now, that is precisely what John Rawls calls overlapping consensus. And he said, Democra says democracy cannot work without overlapping consensus. We need it. And the process that was going on was dialogue. At the end of the evening, everybody didn't agree with one another, not at all. But had they fallen out with each other? No, they hadn't. It was a very civil process. Uh, they obviously enjoy each other's company. And I've uh, read a, a critique of the Council of Europe's work that says, the only dialogue that can work is interfaith dialogue. If you start bringing humanists in, it can't work. Well, he was a perfect example to show that it could work and could work extremely well. Uh, this was dialogue involving all four. Now, for me, 
that is the kind of model that I would want to work for towards in schools. Um, there are all sorts of additional pressures in schools. You've got more people, you've got less time, etc. But that is the sort of ethos of dialogue that I would want to promote. Um, we turn now to the Council of Europe. Uh, the building that you see there is the Palais de Europe, uh, the Palace of Europe, um, in Strasbourg in France, built in the late 1970s. Um, it's not the only building of the Council of Europe, there are others. Uh, if you went to the left of that building, and if you could walk in a diagonal, which you can't, but if you could, after about half a kilometre, you would come to the European Parliament. Aha, what is the relationship between the European Parliament and the Council of Europe? None. There isn't one. They're not related at all, because the European Parliament is to do with the European Union. The Council of Europe goes back to 1949 and is much earlier than the European Union and much bigger in terms of, it. In terms of citizens. There are over 800 million uh, within the Council of Europe, 47 member states there are now. If you went to the right of the building, and there is a road immediately to the right, and followed it up the hill, you come to the river. If you cross the bridge and then cross the road, immediately on your left is the European Court of Human Rights. Well, the European Court of Human Rights is part of the Council of Europe. And a lot of people think it's connected with the European Commission and the European Union, or is part of that, and it isn't. It's part of the Council of Europe. Well then, uh, May 1949 was when it started, originally with 10 states, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear that Sweden was one of them, as was the United Kingdom. Um, uh, this was a body uh, that Churchill was passionate about getting formed. I'd love to be able to bring Winston Churchill back and introduce him to the present British Prime Minister. That will be an interesting conversation. We'll go on there. I wonder what he'd do with his cigar. Uh, anyway, uh, 10 member states originally, and Churchill was um, passionate about the need for the whole thing to be collaborative and international. Unless it is collaborative, human rights aren't going to work. They're not going to happen. And the first big job uh, after the Council of Europe was formed was to draft the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and that was done. And it's a, a, a cross-Europe uh, treaty. Um, all 47 member states are party to the Convention. Um, but, but my own country at the moment shows ambivalence towards the European Convention, to my disgust, I should say. Um, Theresa May, who is currently the Prime Minister of our country, was the Home Secretary before the dreadful Brexit discussion. You, you think of that um, literature house human rights discussion and compare, or rather contrast that, with the so-called debate leading up to the Brexit vote. Uh, there is no comparison because people had no information. Uh, it was uh, totally um, propaganda put out uh, through newspapers and through uh, the United Kingdom Independence Party and so on that was taken up then by the press that governed the way uh, that vote went. Anyway, when she was Home Secretary in April, Theresa May said it is not the European Union that Britain should be coming out of, but the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights. And why did she say that? Because the European Court had made a couple of decisions that she didn't like, she didn't agree with. That's what courts are for, not to let politicians just decide what they want to do. Uh, so, anyway, she's changed her tune now that she is Prime Minister, and she has said that she does not intend to take this policy of coming out of the European Convention forward because she knows that it would not get through Parliament. But I'm still convinced that that's what her personal conviction is. Sad to say. Um, well, what's the Council of Europe there for? 
It is there to protect human rights, pluralist democracy and the rule of law and to promote awareness and development of Europe's cultural identity but also of its cultural diversity. And there's a deliberate creative tension there to have a common European identity whilst respecting the different histories of each nation state and particularly uh, in, our, our, in terms of the topic I'm talking about, histories of religion and state. So there is that interesting relationship. So a ministerial recommendation from uh, the Committee of Ministers at the Council of Europe doesn't say this is what you've got to do, they're not legally binding at all, but please think about these ideas and use them in your policy development. That's what the recommendations are actually meant for. Um, two um, political, uh, major political institutions within the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly, which consists of members of state parliaments, not of the European Parliament, and the Committee of Ministers, which is the foreign ministers of the member states. And the Committee of Ministers periodically, as I've said, makes recommendations. Education is a very important field of work for the Council of Europe and education projects are based in the Directorate General of Democracy. I was there just three weeks ago uh, with the new uh, Director General uh, of Democracy and the Head of Education Policy talking about the work that we are doing uh, on religion and education. Um, okay, what educational work does the Council of Europe do? Well, its, its central focus is on three interrelated areas that really the Council of Europe see as a continuum. They're not seen as completely separate at all. And that is human rights education, citizenship education, and intercultural education or intercultural dialogue. And they're regarded as a continuum. Then you have cutting across, so to speak, and relating to them um, languages, history, media studies, and from 2002, religion, but not before 2002. And then from 2008, religions and non-religious convictions. Now, why was religion not there before 2002? It was not there because being in Strasbourg, in France, in Alsace, um, the Council of Europe followed the French state policy of laïcité, a concept that is very, very much misunderstood and misrepresented. It does not, it is in no way anti-religious. Laïcité is not anti-religious. It involves the idea of state neutrality towards religion and religions, state neutrality. But it also embodies the idea that religion is part of the private sphere and not part of the public sphere. Hence, it's not part of public education. Hence, the Council of Europe didn't do anything about it. Well, I've been back through uh, minutes of meetings going back a long way uh, to almost the early 90s. And the people within the Council of Europe were not happy at all with this policy of laïcité. And the, the argument was being put forward that really religion come, is coming more and more into, into public discussion and we ought to have some education about it. We ought to be thinking about education about religions. But it will be a big investment in money and in time and a big decision to make. And what brought the decision about finally was 9-11 in the United States. Uh, the uh, destruction of the World Trade Center as an act of terrorism. You could hardly say then that the topic of religion was in the private sphere. It was in every newspaper and news broadcast uh, everywhere in the world. So they decided to change the policy. Now, um, Again, I mentioned it's a particular article. Uh, um, I don't even cite it in the written version of the paper, but it, it accuses the Council of Europe of being not secular and impartial, which is what the Council of Europe is, but being secularist and anti-religious. 
Secular is a descriptive term here. Secularist is a normative, anti-religious uh, term. The Council of Europe is, uh, to use a Habermasian term, a public political institution that cannot say, we support uh, the idea that a particular set of beliefs is true, whether they be religious beliefs or humanistic beliefs or whatever. It's not in a position to do that. It has to adopt a stance of impartiality, uh, just like a government does. Um, so it is not anti-religious. Um, and again, this mirrors a discussion we were having in our seminar earlier on. Uh, the Council of Europe talks about the religious dimension of intercultural education. Partly because the term religious education, of course, is very ambiguous and means very different things in different parts of Europe. But also because this work had to relate to that threesome of human rights, citizenship, intercultural, and especially related to the idea of intercultural education. So they talk about the religious dimension of, it, uh, of uh, intercultural education. Now again, that critic says, this reduces religion to culture. The Council of Europe simply thinks that religion is an expression of human culture. The idea that a set of religious claims might be true is totally out of the question. That, I have to say, is absolute nonsense. That is not the view of the Council of uh, Europe. And there is no intention at all to reduce uh, religion uh, to culture. What the Council of Europe is getting at here is that it does not want religion only to be looked at in theoretical terms and in the abstract and in the generic way of looking at uh, uh, Hinduism as a whole tradition or Christianity as a whole tradition. It wants young people to get out there and meet people from religious backgrounds and listen to them and interact with them. That's what it means by an intercultural approach as well as going to the texts and the history and all the rest of it. Well, um, the then Secretary General of the Council of Europe, in, going back to 2002, uh, was an Austrian called Walter Schwimmer, a very interesting person. He called a meeting in September uh, at the Council of Europe. I was invited to take part in that meeting. It was my first visit to Strasbourg. Another person who was invited to take part was Peter Schreiner uh, from Germany. Peter is the chair of uh, the Coordinating Group for Religious Education in Europe, which represents many different professional organisations and associations concerned with religion and education. And Schwimmer said, look, 9-11 is our wake-up call. Now is the time for us to change the policy. We're going to do it. And... What Peter had to say, I just put a little quotation there, what Peter had to say, I think captured the mood of the meeting that we had. It was a, it was a very, very interesting uh, meeting that I had to write a report on um, for uh, the Committee of Ministers. But Peter said, it is impossible to prepare pupils to be active partners in creating the new intercultural European reality without helping them to appreciate the place and influence of the different religions which are now practiced in Europe and in the wider world. And I think that captured the mood of the meeting. So following the meeting, uh, the Council of Europe's very first project on religions and education was set up and called the Challenge of Intercultural Education Today, Religious Diversity and Dialogue in Europe, launched 2002. Uh, with an international team. I was asked to be part of that team, as was uh, Peter. Uh, and it included people from religious education and from intercultural education who had an interest in religions. Um, very, very interesting group of people to work with. Um, it was not only concerned with the social instrumental argument, it was also concerned with the personal, and it went wider than that because it was linked to a very important report on education for the 21st century UNESCO report, the Delors report of 1996, which says that the four pillars of education are learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together and learning to be. 
And those four cover the whole three that I mentioned earlier, the intrinsic and the two instrumental aims are there within those. So we weren't just doing this for social instrumental purposes. We were doing it uh, for a much more wider uh, educational set of arguments. Um, we had a meeting of our group, but we added quite a lot more people to it at the Council of Europe offices in Paris in 2003. So we invited a lot of key intercultural education people and a lot of key religious education people. I met for the first time Barry Van Driel. Barry edits, is uh, editor-in-chief of the journal Intercultural Education. At the time, I was editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Religious Education. Barry hadn't heard of the British Journal of Religious Education. I hadn't heard of the journal Intercultural Education. Neither of us knew about each other's work. When we started to tell each other about what we did, we realised we should have been working together for years. That taught me a lesson I have never forgotten, that religious education should not in any way be isolated. It should be working with others. And uh, I've worked with Barry uh, ever since on lots of different uh, things. So that Paris meeting was important. The Norwegian government, uh, which has been very generous in lots of ways, um, sponsored a conference in 2004 in Oslo, and people came from all over the 47 states. We had policy makers, we had some politicians, we had educators, all meeting together discussing these issues and those of us who were on the uh, working group gave presentations uh, that were discussed and a book came out of that published by the Council of Europe and then our next task was to produce a reference book for schools across Europe uh, which we did which was published by the Council of Europe in 2007. I say published by not terribly well disseminated by uh, but published by and it actually cost money as well now we try and get things uh, open access online uh, so that people don't have to pay for them. Uh, anyway, the reference book came out. Uh, then <clears throat> the committee of ministers uh, started to take quite a lot of interest in what we were doing. And they said, we would like to issue a recommendation to the member states. So some of us uh, participated in a, a, a drafting team working with a subgroup from the Committee of Ministers to produce a draft recommendation which then had to go uh, for consideration by the Committee of uh, Ministers um, and it was eventually published in 2008. But other things were happening. Um, there's a Commissioner for Human Rights. Did you realise that the uh, one up to 2012, I think it was 2006 or 2007 to 2012, was Thomas Hammerberg, Swedish diplomat, uh, absolutely first-rate person. It was lovely working with him. But before him, it was a Spaniard called Alvar Gil Robles, and he held meetings in Malta and in Kazan in the Russian Federation, bringing representatives of religions from across Europe to discuss what the Council of Europe was trying to do about religious diversity in education. And he got support from most of them, not all of them, some of them very suspicious about what we were doing. The vast majority could see the point of it. And um, it was interesting that um, support from that group went to the Parliamentary Assembly and to the Committee of Ministers, uh, saying, you know, what these people are doing is worthwhile. There was also an, inter, uh, an interdisciplinary project started that I took part in, in its, at least in its earlier stages, bringing together religions, citizenship, history, media studies, languages, and social psychology. And we looked at intercultural encounters, um, helping uh, to develop skills, knowledge, attitudes um, for dialogue with people from different cultural and religious backgrounds. And that project has continued uh, into exploring visual media and it's still going and looking at the internet so that the materials coming out of that I think will be tremendously useful not only to religious education people but to educators uh, in general working in the intercultural and inter-religious field and those materials 
are free and will be free uh, on the Council of Europe website. Uh, in 2006, there was discussion within the Council of Europe about whether there should be a European centre dealing with education for human rights, citizenship and intercultural. And what should the scope of it be? Where should it be located? Uh, what should its main tasks be? And I was asked if I would do a feasibility study for such a centre, not an empirical study, but actually to go out and talk to lots of different interested parties and collect some opinion. And I, I, I did that and I went to some member states and tried ideas out and so on, talked to a lot of people in the Council of Europe. Um, and I, I wrote a report and that report said, yes, it will be wonderful to have such a centre. It should not be based in Strasbourg. It will only get confused with what the Council of Europe is doing already in its various projects. It ought to be in a member state and it ought not only to deal with those three areas, it should at least include history and religion as cross-cutting themes. Not languages because there's already uh, a, a very well-functioning languages centre in Graz in Austria. So I put that forward and it was accepted by the Committee of Ministers but they didn't have the money to implement it immediately. But what happened in 2008 is once again, uh, pull your socks up Sweden, um, Norway came forward and uh, this is guilt you see for not being in the European Union, it's possibly that. Uh, Norway came forward and uh, uh, offered to fund such a Council of Europe centre uh, based in Oslo. Um, um, it became known as the European Vergeland Centre. Henrik Vergeland uh, is a 19th century Norwegian romantic poet and activist. And uh, the inauguration of the Vergeland Centre was quite a high profile event. The members of the royal family were there, the Prime Minister was there, uh, the Minister of Education was there. And I said to the Minister of Education, can you give me a thumbnail sketch of Henrik Vergeland? He said, yeah the Bob Geldof of 19th century Norway, uh, which I thought was great. And I've mentioned that to others, and they said, spot on. That's exactly uh, right. Uh, so we had the Vogeland Centre, based initially at Oslo University College. And Oslo University College, it just so happened that they had a rector who was one of my former PhD students. And I was offered uh, a visiting professorship at Oslo University College um, for 20% of my time to go and help the European Vergeland Centre set up its work on religious diversity and education. So I was involved right from the start and I'm very close to the people there. I gave a lecture there just a few days ago, but by Skype uh, to a Polish delegation at the Vergeland Centre uh, in Oslo. So it's still functioning very well and um, I'll say a little bit more about some of the work we've done there. Back at the Council of Europe uh, in 2008 we initiated something called exchanges. This was not taking religious representatives off to Kazan or Malta but bringing them to Strasbourg onto Council of Europe territory and representatives of the Hu European Humanist Federation. And I was asked to co-organise the first meeting in 2008 and it was a little bit stilted because everybody wanted to read a prepared statement from their religious group and their humanist group and so on. But we eventually got some open discussion going. It's, we still haven't got the format right, I don't think, even after all this time. But exchanges have taken place every single year. So those who say the Council of Europe is anti-religious, it's just nonsense. These religious folk in there looking at Council of Europe policy, arguing about it, commenting on it. And that first one, we looked at the work we've been doing and we got terrific support from the vast majority of those people who were there, both the religious people and the humanists. And the religious people said, look, we want to be part of the public support that you should have for teaching about religious diversity, which of course that's exactly the sort of thing I've been looking for. 
And they also gave, they said, look, here are some reasons from our religion, our theology and our ethics, why you should be encouraging an impartial study of religions in schools. That was expressed by dialogues, so, uh, delegates. So that's been a very useful thing. Peter Schreiner's just done one, actually, uh, in Strasbourg, um, but we're trying to think of ways of doing it better. Um, 2008 was also the European Year of Intercultural Dialogue, and there was a white paper on intercultural dialogue uh, published, which summarises some of the work that the Council of Europe uh, had been doing. Uh, and it, at last, the ministerial recommendation came out at the end of 2008. What happens to the ministerial recommendations? Of course, they get sent to the foreign ministries and the education ministries of the 47 member states. What does the Council of Europe do about it then? Not a lot, is the answer. It's up to the states to use the recommendations. Well, back at the uh, Vergeland Centre, we were concerned um, that there wasn't much going on with the recommendation, and we, we thought there should be. Let me just give you the flavour of the recommendation. I'm not going through the whole thing. It's there in the appendix uh, to this book, which I'll pass around if you want to have a look at it. Uh, the book I wrote um, called Signposts, and the recommendations are there as an appendix. But this just gives you the flavour. Respecting the right of people to hold a belief, promoting knowledge and understanding. The knowledge is not enough on its own. You've got to try. How can we understand what someone means when they say, I believe in X, or I have offered this to Y, or whatever? Uh, what techniques can we use to try and get as close to understanding what they mean? as we possibly can. Uh, addressing controversial issues, not avoiding them, actually dealing with them directly. Developing tolerance as the bottom line. Nurturing sensitivity to diversity. Creating space for dialogue. Developing critical skills and reflective skills, both. Analysis and, in and interpretation skills with impartiality and combating prejudices and stereotypes. That's the flavour. Well, at the Vergeland Centre, we, we thought, well, there's not enough happening about the recommendation. So we had a meeting with our colleagues in Strasbourg, and they said, well, let's set up a joint committee of Council of Europe, European Vergeland Centre, try and look at why things aren't happening, and try and make them happen. So again, I was asked to be vice chair of that committee and the chair was the recently retired head of education uh, at the Council of Europe. Again, it was an international team. And what we decided to do was to send a questionnaire to the 47 ministries saying, look, you've got the recommendation, look at it and tell us what you think the issues would be in implementing this or even using it as a tool and a resource in your particular state. We got a very good response rate. And the striking thing was that countries as different as France and Estonia actually came up with a very similar list of key points. And we decided that the points that were made, that, that you know, these are the issues, A, B, C, D, E, they would become the central chapters of the book that I would write. Uh, let me tell you that this book my intention of the book was that it doesn't tell you what to do. It does not. It says, here is a tool for you to use. Please use the tool. That's the philosophy. I was speaking, I'd been speaking in Estonia. I went on the ferry from Tallinn to Helsinki. I was speaking at Helsinki <laughs> University about this. And I was saying, this is the intention of the book, but I've no idea what to call the book. And I remember who it was. She was called Sila Poulter, sitting in the audience. And she said, how, and it, it took a fin to, do, to come up with the English word, how about signposts? I thought, ah, that's the word, signposts. But of course, when I'd finished the book and it went off to be printed, the Council of Europe, without telling me, sent it off to a cover designer who totally misinterpreted what I meant by signposts. So now you have Christianity going one way, Islam another, Judaism a third. Ah, 
And they've also published a, a new working paper written by me, and they've used the same cover on that. So, uh, you, can, you know, sometimes you can't win, and you just have to accept defeat uh, over that. Um, anyway, it's the, the book is meant as a tool um, for teacher trainers. Teachers, it's meant, you know, to go into the hands of teachers um, uh, so they can use it. It's a guide to issues. Uh, what I did, um, having got the uh, a source material, each member of our joint committee wrote a paper from their own expertise. So I had a set of wonderful papers to draw upon as source material. I also had the questionnaire, the analysed questionnaire returns to draw on. And I went to recent examples of European research and brought examples where they were relevant to practice brought the examples out. I also went to examples of good practice from different parts of Europe and put them in. But, you know, I had a tight timetable uh, to do it, but it got done. As Jenny said, it's, uh, been tra it's now translated. Ah, I have news for you. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow we will have a Swedish translator. If anybody's interested in translating it into Swedish, and this is typical Council of, Council of Europe, before the end of December, yeah, uh, please let me know. There is money involved if you want to do it. But I'm speaking to uh, the head of translation at Stockholm University who thinks he might have somebody interested in translating. I found a Norwegian translator yesterday who's going to do it. The daughter of a professor of religious education who happens to be doing a master's in translation studies in Oslo. That's what gave me the idea of contacting translation studies in Stockholm. Uh, anyway, it's f uh, all these translations, we, we took um, decisive act action at the Vergeland Centre. We put PDFs of all of these free of charge on the European Vergeland Centre website and said to the Council of Europe, what are you going to do about it? They said, oh, well, we won't charge either then. So, uh, so we won that one and it no longer costs uh, nine euros or whatever uh, for the PDF. Okay. These were the key points in the questionnaire returns. Terminology was an issue. What on earth does religious education mean? The descriptive evaluative thing, secular, secularist. Somebody said, in Russia, if the word secular is used, it always is normative, never descriptive. Whereas in France, secular usually means descriptive. Um, competence. What is competence for understanding religious? Well, we look at the kind of knowledge, skills and attitudes that you would need and we give some examples of didactical approaches, interpretive and dialogical uh, approaches that could be used in didactics. Just about everybody who responded said, how do you make the classroom a safe space for dialogue? And it was a good question then and it's, I think, an even better question now in my country, it's become a question. There is a policy called prevent, which is causing a lot of teachers to be very, very careful about what discussion they allow to happen in classrooms. Very, very sad that that is happening. But anyway, classroom is a safe space. I uh, went to uh, um, research that uh, Professor Shire, Guy Shire, who's over there, and I had been involved in, in Europe, and we took some Norwegian research from uh, Maria von der Lippe, uh, on that uh, topic. We took some research from Estonia and from Russia on that as well, as an example. Um, analyzing media representations of religions. This is a major, major topic. How do you help young people to... And young people, you see, and this is Maria von der Lippe's research, she said, in the work I did in Bergen, clearly the adolescents there, the 15-year-olds, knew that there was something wrong with media representations of religious, but they didn't have the techniques to know how to unpack that. And they needed help from teachers. And the teachers need help from media studies uh, on, on this. Um, so I give examples from research and from good practice. Good practice being the Council of Europe's work uh, in this field. Um, how do you integrate a study of non-religious worldviews? Well, Sweden's got long experience of this, but many countries haven't. One or two people even said, what is a non-religious worldview? Do you just mean secular humanism? Or could we list 19? Do you, do you include utilitarianism? Or this, that, the other? 
Um, these questions hadn't been dealt with. I try to cover the issues here. Um, what language do we use? Do we talk about life views like uh, you do in the Nordic countries? Do we talk about world views? Um, there's a lot of new literature on world views coming from the Netherlands, for example. Um, what language do we use with this and how wide do we go? How do we stop the curriculum becoming overloaded with all this great long list of things that have got to be covered? We don't want to have an overloaded curriculum. Of course not, quite right. Uh, then human rights issues and uh, linking schools to wider communities and uh, organisations. Uh, Therese Halverson Britton had to leave uh, uh, for, for uh, her family uh, reasons, but one of the one of the pieces of research I use in uh, signposts is Therese's work. I met her in Iceland, of all places, and found out about her work. So I used her work on uh, communities, uh, linking communities to schools. Uh, as an example, I also used the work of Lars Neslund uh, from Stockholm University as an example, and quite a lot of examples from the UK and uh, elsewhere. Okay, um, just in conclusion then, um, yes, human rights provide a rationale for this kind of work, but only, only, only a partial rationale, not a complete rationale. They especially contribute to the social instrumental aim, but not to the lot. It's got to be looked at more broadly. However, dialogue, which is central to human rights discourse, is central also to the practice of this form of religious education, but together with knowledge and understanding. And we have to work at understanding. And that religious education teachers, and I've learned this through this experience, really must work collaboratively with others um, dealing with values in education. And signposts uh, is a kind of free resource to help people along the way. Uh, now, what are we doing now? Well, I told you that we have a Stockholm uh, seminar, which includes Sodaturn and Stockholm School of Theology, as well as Stockholm University. Um, we are linking up, we have linked up. Uh, I was in uh, Stavanger with Gaya Shire uh, last week or the week before um, uh, working with colleagues there uh, uh, also with colleagues from Trondheim who came down but I've been and worked with the colleagues uh, up in Trondheim and we've got uh, Volder involved as well more partners will uh, come in and I hope more partners from Sweden and we have my home University of Warwick uh, and we're already linking up on this and looking at research proposals, um, Trondheim already have some funding. Uh, while we were in Stavanger, and I think with one hour to go before the deadline, uh, we submitted um, uh, a bid to a Swedish funding body uh, for money for dissemination of research. And what we pl we're planning to do there is to have like a community of practice involving university researchers, teacher trainers, teachers, and what you call, I think, teacher students, which I call student teachers, uh, um, uh, that way around. But we, we've planned uh, to work together and we've got some ideas about disseminating research that we're going to test out in the community of practice, having some videos, to have a, a two-minute video with Jenny, talking about what she's doing with Bill Gent. Then we'd have a 20-minute podcast of Jenny going into more detail and then there will be some text this is what you're going to be doing this is my revenge on you right um, um, then there will be some text and the text will be produced not purely by the researchers themselves but by the researchers in collaboration with the teachers so that the text is as <coughs> practical and useful for teachers as possible that all then goes on to the website of the European Vogeland Centre and is made available and we're developing a research network and all communication will be via the European Vogeland Centre, plus uh, websites of our universities and the European Forum for Teachers of Religious Education also have offered their website uh, to us. But I have spoken for longer than I should have done, so thank you very much indeed, and I stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, for 
bringing us into the world of uh, the Council of Europe and also the Norwegian uh, Vergeland Center and its work on intercultural education. And maybe Norway felt guilt, but they also have a lot of oil. So <laughs> until the day, Sitting, yeah, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, economical power. Okay, so we open up the floor now for some questions, I think, from the audience. Uh, and I will uh, bring around this one. Mike. Okay, Kalander. Is this working? I don't know. No, I don't think it's working. Is it working? Oh. Yeah, I think they want the you to use it because the they're recording. Okay, you need it for recording. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I heard your name so many times. So it was I've been working with Jenny years ago. So it's nice to see you in 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 in, in person. <laughs> so thank you for your for your speech. Uh, I I just have a short comment, uh, maybe adding to a list of yeah. of critiques of human rights. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a questions about the educational part of religious education. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first, uh, and, and, and this is uh, actually also coming from that we just recently had Chantal Mouf here. Yeah. Uh, and her critique, I think, of human rights is not yeah. so much of the human rights themselves, yes. but about the institutions that follow from human rights. Yeah. So it's an infrastructure of a Western kind of uh, institutionalization of society that it is required for human rights to work. So, and that work counterproductive for many countries who doesn't have operate societies in the same way. So, so that's, I don't know what you can do with that, but it's, it's, just, it's just a comment. Sorry for that, but yeah. yeah. So maybe add to the list. <laughs> But the second one is more about the educational parts, and, and that is that it seems to be relying so much on liberalism. Yeah. And, and of course, liberalism is important to establish education in many countries. Uh, but it is also a problem uh, because, as I see, liberalism itself, particularly in Rawls' version, have no program for education. Yeah. So there is no education in Rawls. It's even, I would say, it's an anti educational stance in roles yeah. and particularly in political liberalism it's i think it's on page 83 but i'm not sure uh, there he explaining his uh, his whole kind of program yeah. by saying that which will bring stability to a society in the long run yeah. it's an adoption to laws of nature as they are interpreted by psychology yeah. into culture so that there is no room for education, there is room for psychology, yeah. but only in relation to the, the interpretation on the laws of nature, yeah. because that is what makes society stable. Yeah. That is very much counter to the, sorry for this, I will not do this very long, but <laughs> this, this is very much counter to, for example, the, the old Greek concept of yeah. padeia yeah. and, and the sophist's idea about the need of teaching yeah. in order for people yeah. and societies to work. Okay. So it's just a pro so, so, so yeah. is there room for something else in religious education than yeah. the liberal view? Yeah, okay. So well, uh, thank you. Uh, very helpful. Uh, re regarding the uh, first, um, yes, we, w we have to make things uh, as international as we possibly can. And, co you know, I've been talking about the Council of Europe, but there are many other arenas. And there are lots and lots of opportunities. I've been uh, working with South African colleagues who are working on human rights in South Africa. Every possible opportunity for dialogue in every possible situation, like it within families and you know, groups like that. It doesn't have to be in institutions like the Council of Europe. Though I do think the Council of Europe is important, it's terribly important that every institution, I think every conceivable institution, needs to be self-critical needs to be looking at what it's doing. Uh, you know, I told you about the exchanges. Uh, they could be going 10 times better than they are, but they've not been self-critical enough about them. They, they've just said, right, we'll have another one next year. Uh, it's not good enough. It's, it's got to be much more critical than that. So I, I totally agree that an institution like that is just one arena where human rights should be discussed. Human rights should be discussed everywhere. I was appalled. I did not hear the term human rights throughout the whole Brexit campaign, not once. 
did I hear the term human rights used by any political party in my country. Oh, it's, it's utterly disgraceful. So uh, they need to be discussed. And as I said, uh, the, I, I have this flexibility, this dialogical liberalism thing where I'm perfectly happy to talk with somebody about whether, say, autonomy might sometimes be relative and not absolute. Whereas if you treat the human rights codes like a creed, a set of creedal statements, it can become really quite Western and rigid. So that um, the uh, Rawls thing, um, uh, I find those three concepts useful. I don't find, I, I'm, I'm not a Rawls person for the whole of Rawls. I once took one idea from Richard Rorty and I'm still labelled as a rampant postmodernist. <laughs> By, uh, by a particular writer called Philip Barnes from the United Kingdom. But he quoted Rawls, says Barnes, you know, so he must be a postmodernist. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not a Rawlsian either. Um, and I, again, I, I use concepts that I find useful. And I actually just found those, uh, have found those quite useful concepts uh, to use. Uh, but, you know, the dialogue has to keep going across all kinds of boundaries. Um, ideological and other kinds of boundaries um, but when it comes down to it you know I, I feel my commitment to human rights is almost like a religious commitment um, that the human dignity thing either you're committed to it or you're not in the end um, and it's it's how it works out you know I've spoken to um, uh, Bhikkhu Parekh who was the the Hindu writer who made those critical <coughs> remarks and we both at Root said, yeah, actually, both of us, it is almost like an emotional, emotional or even existential commitment to something, but that then we have to work out how we express it in, a, in our different cultural milieu. I don't know whether I've... Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as a study of religions person, I know that uh, religious texts can be interpreted in very many ways and right now I interpreted Apostoli's sign language as we will have one more question <laughs> in terms of time. Maybe he was trying to say something else because we're running a bit short of time here. Any more questions or comments? Okay, then I hand over to Apostoli. Well, we're a bit instrumental here at Southern University. So th one of the reasons we invited is that we were getting some kind of reputation by association. So when important people are coming here, we get some kind of, you know, we're becoming known in the world. But as a kind of memory, and of course uh, we want you to show for all your friends and connections, you will get a present here and it is the complete series uh, of the lecture so this Thank is you. for you, you. and uh, you so, so you you see yeah. you know who were the others who have been here oh, and uh, you are in a you, you are in a good you are in a good company okay thank it's you so much kind of thank you very much indeed well it, it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to come and uh, i hope to see a bit more of you after uh, the event um i've been asked to play some music with uh, a Swedish child, you know, Jenny, uh, she, she doesn't ask for much, you know. Uh, she said, come and do the sort of turn lecture and then would, you, would I play with the Swedish jazz trio? Uh, so we haven't met yet. Uh, we're going to meet uh, shortly uh, and uh, we're going to meet a nice bass player called Mats Dimming and a guitarist and a drummer and I'll get my trombone out or somebody else's trombone that I borrow and uh, hopefully play some jazz. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. If you want copies of previous lectures, please take. Right. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Come up down. Thank you very much. Was it all right? Yeah. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh, my, my pleasure. My Interesting. Pleasure. Great. Uh, I have three sons, and I think I will answer some questions. Okay. Now yeah, yeah. they ask me. Well, yeah, yeah. And especially the negative freedom. Well, if I don't.